Hello and welcome to SuperCloud 7 live from our Palo Alto studio and on demand with top leaders in the data and AI space. You know, customers are trying to get AI right. And as such, the need to rationalize siloed data becomes increasingly important as well. Concerns over privacy, legal risk, and compliance, you know, meaning specifically governance, is front and center in the decision-making process. And we're here with Rohan Kumar of Microsoft, along with my co-host, George Gilbert, to understand how customers are thinking about the challenges of running fast with data to create AI capabilities while at the same time not breaking things. In other words, meeting corporate governance edicts. Rohan, thanks so much for coming on the program. Thank you for having me. It's great to be there. Uh, you bet. All right, why don't we start with your role and pun intended, your purview at Microsoft. Oh, thank you. Yeah, so I uh, lead the, the team uh, that essentially you know works on a few areas. Uh, you know, one of them is Microsoft purview, of course. You know, covering the breadth of uh, data security, data governance, and uh, our data compliance, and um, and then with the Freeva uh, solutions we have around you know uh, 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 on offering around privacy, privacy of data, and finally uh, the work we are doing to sort of create this what we call the unified uh, security platform uh, for our solutions and for third parties. So we're super interested in this conversation. I mean, when we talk to data practitioners, they could put all their data eggs into a single platform basket, but that's proving impractical, as you know. And then, so firms are moving to an open model where they can maintain control of their data, bring any compute engine to any of their data. And while that's compelling, the capabilities to, to govern open data across the entire state are immature, but it seems like open table formats are really gaining traction. And even the point of control is sort of shifting from the database to the governance catalog. There's multiple governance catalogs to choose from, open source, hybrid open source, uh, proprietary. How do you see this playing out with customers? And, and what's Microsoft's point of view on this challenge? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. And, and I'll maybe sort of step back and sort of share a few you know, observations just in terms of what we're seeing happen, especially the, you know, as you've sort of spoken to the customers over the last several years. I mean, you know, initially, like just like you mentioned, there are se several data systems in every enterprise, right? There's, you know, you look at, uh, you know, anyone with a reasonable amount of scale, uh, they have multiple solutions that they have invested in. It could sort of lead to multiple open source standards when it comes to file formats, et cetera. And if you put yourself in the shoes of the data officer, they've been struggling with, you know, how do you sort of meet the demands of, you know, uh, the fact that data needs to be leveraged for a lot of decision making. And, and ensuring that it's always sort of correct and, and fit for purpose and use. And especially over the last, I'd say, 12 to 18 months or so, especially with the advent of Gen AI and just the need uh, has significantly gone up, right? So we see like two, uh, 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 you know, very critical trends, which is, you know, ultimately there is there's a lot of augmentation of the, you know, large language models with data that's very specific, you know, uh, to a specific context in an enterprise and ensuring that the data is ready for that, like so sort of to move away from having this notion of a centralized data governance uh, to something that's maybe more federated across domains while maintaining you know, the guardrails that are important to avoid things like data leakage and uh, 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 et cetera. So those are the two, I'd say, you know, uh, uh, broad themes that we hear for the customers. And the other big you know, point that I'll mention is if you look at traditional data governance, so, you know, apart from being siloed, was very focused on the technical user, right? So the, the, the data engineers were building out the pipelines, you know, them understanding SQL tables and, and, and uh, whereas, you know, a lot of the work around data products where the true business value comes out, essentially, you know, lands up, you know, was, uh, lands up becoming like this handshake where there was a lot of requirements that came to the central teams, you know, with the data officer and they had to sort of go invest in making that happen. So the approach that we've taken, and, and, and this is really based on a lot of the customer feedback we've received, is how do we empower the business user? So when you look at somebody who is, you know, the data steward in the marketing domain or the finance domain, for them to sort of work, curate the data as they need to, create the data products, serve the needs of, you know, uh, the Gen AI usage is an example for their domain within the enterprise, uh, without having to sort of, you know, centralize all that work uh, while maintaining the guardrails that are needed. So... In, 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 in like a, uh, many ways, that's the essence, you know, of, of the big announcement, uh, you know, that we are making around data governance today. 
You mentioned the chief data officer uh, earlier, and this this month is the chief data officer conference, CDO IQ, which used to be part of MIT. Now it's sort of grown into, you know, its own thing. You know, the chief data office, so it, it, even data quality used to be this back office function. Yep. The CDO emerged initially in highly regulated industries. Uh, and then, of course, the Hadoop trend and the whole big data trend, but that got really, really technical. So you had others in the organization kind of was really driving the bus there. And then during cl the cloud era brought the developers into the fold. And now with AI and everybody trying to get their data estate right, uh, you, you're absolutely right. The, the, the chief data officer is really one representing the business and the business interest first, particularly as it relates to governance and compliance. You know, which wasn't as front and center, you know, let's say 10 or 15 years ago. H how do you see the chief data officer's role ev evolving specifically in the context of what you just discussed? Oh, it's, you know, I essentially believe that the chief data officer essentially is a very critical role, role in any enterprise, right? Again, at, at, at the highest levels, and, you know, you know, some of this stuff is pretty obvious, but it's important uh, to sort of note, which is, you know, you're, you know, especially when it comes to sort of leveraging you know, Gen AI and, and leveraging the LLMs and ensuring that there is there is no hallucination, et cetera, the context of data, you know, how ready your data is to sort of augment the model becomes very important, right? And that sort of, in many ways, solely falls, uh, you know, today that responsibility of making sure that across the organization that's happening in the right manner, it falls on the data officer. So it's actually a very, very important responsibility. Now they struggle with it today. Just, I mean, if you look at just the volumes you look at like a single person in a centralized manner having a responsibility across every domain of the enterprise to do this right, it's just a very, very tall order. And that's why a lot of things get stuck. They get serialized uh, um, because a lot of the data exposure, if you look at any of the catalogs, it's very technical today, right? And and it sort of doesn't map to, so when we talk about the health of the data, you know, how much of the understanding when you think about cataloging of your data is at the business user level, right? When we talk about data products, not just you know, technical implementation of a SQL table, but hey, there's these bunch of tables that, you know, come together to inform a data product as an example, right? So having visibility at that level in a decentralized manner, that I think is going to be key uh, to ensuring that the data officer can scale in their role, just given the, you know, the volume of the data that's sort of growing. The other huge part of this is essentially pushing the responsibility of curating and ensuring that the data has the right health to the individual owners of the business domains. I think that's going to be very, very critical because that's where the true understanding is, right? So if you, you know, you talk to a marketing person, you talk to a data steward inside finance, et cetera, they have a true understanding of what the right data should look like, right? What the, you know, the product should look like and sort of elevating, you know, when we think about the catalog at that level becomes important. Now, of course, the reality of every enterprise is there is not a single catalog. There is not, you know, typically a lot of those are, you know, tied very much to, you know, the, the data solutions that they use. I mean, you know, an enterprise can have multiple analytic solutions as an example. Each of them come with their own understanding of a catalog. It's, it's very technical in nature. But our approach really has been like, how do we sort of step back and think about this notion of being a catalog of catalogs? So it's not about copying, but having that notion of federation and up-leveling the data to the business user context and making that available. Got it. Uh, I think that's going to be super important. Yeah. And so, so George, I wonder if you could sort of chime in, chime in on this, Ron. George and I have done, been doing a lot of work, and George in particular has done a ton of research on the notion. The premise is basically as data platforms evolve, we see them increasingly as tools for analytic systems to, to take action and drive business outcomes. I, I mean, that's sort of the, the long-term vision. And because catalogs are now becoming open source, the value, as we said up front, is shifting toward these tool chains. Um, and we, so we have this vision of intelligent data apps um, that are going to be leveraging these highly technical sort of, you know, governance challenges. But we like to look at things as, you know, what is it? Um, w how does it work and what's the business outcome? We talked a little bit about sort of the business vision. Uh, but George, I wonder if you could weigh in on this and let's dig into some of the how it works type of questions that you'll have. So maybe, Rohan, you, you, you talked about a catalog of catalogs um, and that the, the right now that there are these islands of governance how do you um how do you sort of encompass all of those how do you discover th the assets not just by connecting to catalogs that govern islands but then finding 
other assets? And then sort of what's the scope of all the assets that that you can discover and how do you find them? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a great question. So, you know, there is foundationally, if you think about just even having understanding of your entire data, say it's at the physical level, George, and, and, and I'm sure you appreciate this, is an extremely daunting task. It's very, very complex. You know, when you look at the world where almost every medium to large enterprise essentially has a multi-cloud strategy, many of them still have, you know, a, a pretty sizable amount of data that's actually maintained on-prem. And just getting a very comprehensive understanding of what exists, you know, at a physical uh, data asset level across all their analytic systems, whether it's in, you know, various cloud environments or on-prem, is like a foundation to get started, right? And and some of that comes with, depending on the solutions that they've derived, you know, there could be existing catalogs that are covering a portion of their estate, as an example. Like I said, today, if you look at it, almost every analytic system essentially comes with an understanding of its own cartilage. If you look at back in the day, every database, relational database, had this notion of a system catalog, right? Which essentially gives you, hey, what are my servers? What are my databases? What are my tables inside the database? And that's how the lineage uh, is sort of granted. So we basically have, you know, what we call a scanning infrastructure that, we, you know, like has an understanding of each of these solutions. And we are betting pretty heavily on open source standards with things like Atlas, as an example, from a consumption and, and production based API. And then, you know, there is an element of a, things just outside of these. You know, when you think about operational stores, which may be typically aren't captured in these analytic systems, having a discovery on them because that helps you with the lineage tracking. Right? So it's not just what has landed, but really what was the source, who made the changes, what changes were made. Now, what I will say is a lot of this depends on the system. Like some of the systems, like what's publicly available through the API is based on the chain sets that we can capture. So those are the things that, you know, uh, uh, you know we, we're very heavily focused on because that we believe is foundation, like getting a comprehensive understanding that's right. Now, once that happens, once you have the understanding, the big innovation really what we've been working on, it seems very simple, but it's it's really like ensuring the visibility of that, you know, on a per domain manner. So if you're in marketing, what are the assets that are important for you? How do you want to put together a bunch of these physical data assets in a way that creates a meaningful product from a marketing standpoint, right? Today, a lot of that is very, very ad hoc. It's very centralized. There's requests that go from, you know, the data offices seen from the business domains, and it's extremely challenging. And so that's the area where we try to disrupt. And essentially says, imagine that accountability moves back into the business owner, with data stewards of the business. Everybody has it, uh, you know, and, and especially in the world of AI, it's going to become extremely critical at the end. You know, the, the, the thing that we're hearing constantly from our customers is, look, all this stuff needs to happen much faster than it does today. Like the pace of innovation, et cetera, needs to significantly improve, which essentially means, you know, like having that understanding, you know, that I sort of spoke about, and essentially exposing that information to you know these various data owners in a way that they can, in a decentralized manner, you know, uh, use those assets, use the experiences that we've built to create you know, the outcomes that they want. So maybe a follow-on question is: Is this something we were we were talking about earlier? Um, is it is it in a centralized sort of data governance organization that they would um, want to ultimately set policy right. that would work on a global level, and then at the decentralized level where they're working with the data products, is there some plan to start adding more and more meaning to the data beyond just glossaries, but, you know, richer richer semantics? 100%. I think it's a great point, which is, and this is really where if you sort of step back and take a look, typically policies associated with data started from the domain of security, right? You know, you essentially look at, hey, Beyond just the access controls, if you want to have policies which say, hey, based on the nature of data, as an example, if, they, if this data has PII information you know, associated with some of our customers, then only this security group can have access to it, right? That's policy-based, you know, what we call policy-based access control. What we see sort of seeing, you know, George, is if you look at like, and talking to a lot of customers, they essentially want the governance to be associated with policies as well. And that's really how the decentralized consumption and production of data sort of maintained. So you can imagine the data officer coming out with this notion of policies associated with the nature of data as an example, right? Independent of who is sort of creating data products, you know, how, how do those policies get implemented in a federated manner becomes very, very important. So this is, in some sense, you know, the approach that we've taken. If you look at, you know, stepping back for a second, 
And I look at Microsoft Purview as a suite of solutions, even though today at the data uh, 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 you know, governance conference, we are sort of announcing the new suite of data governance solutions that we're launching and making generally available. But we have you know, two sister solutions in data security, compliance, and privacy as a part of this entire suite. And the labeling infrastructure for policies is essentially common across all of them. So imagine where you create the label in a centralized manner, right? You create the policy in a centralized manner as a data officer, and the and the implementation of that policy happens in a decentralized manner. So wherever the you know the view of the catalog is taken, you know the the uh, you know the the, uh, the people who are implementing uh, these data products inside various domains essentially respect that policy that's come centrally. If that makes sense, and that's that's where we really believe there's a world where a lot of these investments around data security, governance, compliance, and privacy need to have that shared common infrastructure platform, even though within an enterprise, there are different owners that manage each of these, if that makes sense. Yeah, okay. So, and and well then, th this policy execution depends on local implementation of, and respect for the, for the tags, and right. that would go all the way eventually on-prem, multi-cloud, right. but you want to be the authoring environment and potentially the tagging environment. That's right. And and the way we've sort of done this is, so, so there's the authoring piece of it, the policy. And then if you look at it, we work with a lot of, uh, uh, not just our first party sources, you know, look at, you know, uh, uh, you know Azure Storage as an example, but we're looking at on-prem systems or databases like SQL Server that's deployed on-prem, or if your data is in, you know, other clouds like S3 and Amazon as an example, how do you enforce these policies in a decentralized manner as well, right? So, you know, we basically have, we're working with a lot of our customers to understand what are the most important data systems where they want these policies enforced. Of course, it's, you know, you can imagine the coverage is, complete coverage is going to sort of incrementally happening over time, but we are prioritizing that. We started, you know, the, the good news over here, you know, George essentially is we basically built out this entire infrastructure for M365. So if you look at Microsoft Purview, the entire labeling policy infrastructure that gives you data security, that's the basis. It's a very highly deployed solution today. That's really what we're getting to compliance, governance, and then extending that same approach that we have taken to other stores like SQL, you know, Fabric, you know, uh, S3 and Amazon, et cetera. Okay, so when, go ahead, George, please. When, one last question on, on, on governance. You, you talked about lineage earlier. Um, lineage is really hard um, to pull together from, from what we gather if it's not supplied by, you know, a vendor already end to end. But is that something where, is that sort of the backbone for all the, the quality and observability? And would other vendors plug data about that into your solution? Or would they draw the lineage from purview into their solutions and then add the quality and observability if, you know, metadata on top of that? It's, it's both. So what I would say is, you know, you're right. I mean, ultimately, the lineage that you capture essentially is completely reliant on the data source and what is it that they're exposing through their public API infrastructure. You know, if you look at within databases, there's this concept of change logs, which, you know, it's it's a very standardized practice. If you look at a lot of the data lakes, a very, very similar, you know, concept around, you know, maintaining, you know, changes, et cetera, is coming together. But, you know, there is... The, the depth of the information that you can capture as a part of lineage is very much, to your point, dependent around, you know, what gets exposed in. And what I will say is, based on a lot of the customer in, you know, conversations we have, the deeper that a data system can go, the more beneficial it is. Because, you know, at that point, you're sort of exposing all the insights. It's not just what change was made, but who made the change, when did they make the change, you know. And it helps with things like, you know, again, when it comes to the health of data, on which you're sort of trying to bet your entire AI application as an example, if they have an issue earlier up in the data pipeline, how do you quickly understand the, you know, the 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 traversal impact on like how many things you know need to get updated as an example if there was a mistake that was made. So for those things, you know, the deeper you understand the lineage, the better it is. And and so yeah, we try to basically capture everything that you know we can lay our hands on, and you know we have uh, 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 data solutions that we work with that expose the stuff. Now if there is an application you know, that's built on top of a different solution as an example that wants to query the lineage from us, they're absolutely, you know, they, they can do that. Okay, so I want to summarize here. So you've got this federated model, irrespective of data location, cross-cloud, on-prem, is our super cloud concept. 
you get you support multiple multiple data formats, a lot of different diversity, um, and then you know you've got technical metadata, you know field lengths and file formats and schemas, and then you got business metadata, all the business rules and, and data definitions, and you see different models for that. You know, op open source Horizon is 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 open source. Polaris is now totally open source, but the business metadata you got to stay inside of, for instance, Snowflake. You don't care about any of that. Um, if I understand it, you'll, if based on your last comment, you'll ingest whatever you can and, and, and then help the customers manage all that complexity at a higher level of abstraction to reach a business outcome, you know, which is essentially democratizing, uh, and having a consistent data platform. And then, and then, so did I get that right? And then can you just, can we close on how you're applying AI to all of that? The second part of what I asked, you know, George, the sort of systems of agency that ultimately is sort of the near-term holy grail, being able to take action with confidence and governance. Got it. I mean, and so I think you sort of got that uh, completely right. The only thing I'd say is it's not that I don't care, I deeply care. Ah. <laughs> but if I put myself in the shoes of the customers uh, uh, over there, uh, uh, it is really about like, you know, for their business outcomes, what is it that they need? You know, frankly, you know, like I said, you know, multiple data systems are going to exist. I think, you know, we sort of aligned on that. And our approach essentially has been like the, you know, the the breadth of the data that we can capture to understand their estate, uh, 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 you know, the the, uh, uh, the better it is, you know, that comprehensive understanding for our customers. So that's really like, you know, mission mission number one for us. The other thing I, I sort of say is the part of governance, you know, like quality of data becomes really important. This is, it's always been important. And, but frankly, you know, when it comes to the age of AI, uh, um, it has sort of taken a whole different meaning. Like you really, the the, uh, uh, the way now machines uh, can, based on the large language model, start, you know, uh, giving you answers is going to holistically depend both on their accuracy and the spread, like how, you know, to ensure that there's no leakage that happens. Now on the AI part, I'd say there's two things, right? First essentially is, you know, the thing that's most, uh, uh, you know, well understood, which is, hey, look, I mean, data is at the foundation of you know any AI project and or AI application, and using governance just to make sure that the data is right, the health of the data is right. We have a very good understanding of things like lineage, uh, etc., and uh, uh, ensuring that it's available, it has the right policies from an access control standpoint, as an example, to ensure that it's being used by the right set of users. Uh, 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 you know, to get the outcomes that they didn't, you know, want. So both of those things, which is the health of the data and then the policies to ensure that the governance, you know, around uh, around data is, is is very important. Obviously, there is a you know, whole, you know, angle just, you know, as when you double click on the governance around just, you know, uh, ensuring that, you know, it's uh, the attack vectors on the models themselves are protected. You know, again, it goes back to the security of the model and how do you ensure you use things like, uh, 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 policy-based, you know, access control to ensure that who uh, is allowed to sort of go uh, update and change the context that's associated, you know, uh, with the LLM as an example. That's one whole category, and there is, you know, solutions that you're providing to that. The other thing that we're very heavily investing in is this notion of how do you leverage Gen AI to make governance itself better, right? And that's huge. But just imagine a world where you know you're using the, you know, using Microsoft Teams as an example and somebody shares a, a link to a Power BI report. Now, in the context of that, somebody sends you an email, you know, uh, you know, with a, a specific data set. Now, imagine in the context of that, like in that experience, you're able to ask a question. So think about your data governance co-pilot, right? Where you say, okay, this, somebody sent me this Power BI report, tell me about its lineage, like where did it come from? Right in that context, you know, you, you know having the ability to start interacting with that data set is something that we're very heavily investing in. Because at the end of the day, it's not just about, you know, governance so far. I mean, there's a whole business user thing that we spoke about, decentralized, federated. But it's it's still like out of your current experience, right? Which is, you know, you work in productivity tools. You're using Excel, right? Excel is like, especially for financial markets, it's it's a huge. Now imagine in the context of Excel and the co-pilot of Excel. It's not just about uh, making Excel better, but imagine if you're able to ask a lot of questions on the data that you're importing itself. Right? Wouldn't that be a, a, a an ideal outcome? So those those are the kind of that's just one example, but that's that tells you how we're sort of looking at leveraging uh, uh, Gen AI 
for improving data governance pretty significantly as well. Got it. Hopefully that makes sense. We're, yeah, it does. We're out of time, but I have one last question. What, what We're here in July of 2024, Rohan. What would you like to be able to say in next summer, 2025, that you can't say today? You know, I mean, a huge part I'd sort of say that we're very focused on um, is this notion of, you know, this whole paradigm, if you take a look at, you know, what happened, you know, in the initial uh, innovation that we worked on is around these notion of co-pilots that are associated, which significantly help in every area of work, whether it's productivity, security, business applications, et cetera. You know, more and more, just as the power of these models improves, we are looking at this notion of agents who significantly complement, you know, think about, you know, in many ways, co-pilot on steroids, where there is a lot of reasoning that typically humans do today, which we believe uh, uh, these models will become either already are capable of, you know, for simple scenarios, or they'll get smarter and smarter. So for developers who are trying to build those workflows, those agentic workflows, uh, um, you know, how do we ensure that the governance is able to meet uh, their requirements and their scale? So that we believe is a paradigm shift. Uh, uh, it's a it's a huge area of focus, you know, you know, broadly for the entire industry. We are very very heavily focused on that as well, and uh, uh, we are looking at a, from a governance standpoint, from a security standpoint, from a compliance standpoint. What is it that we we'll need to be ready with to make sure that those endeavors with our customers are very successful? Thank you so much, Rohan, for participating in SuperCloud Seven. Really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for having me. It was great to talk to you guys. Okay, uh, on behalf of the, the SuperCloud 7 team and George Gilbert, this is Dave Vellante. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned for more great conversations from SuperCloud 7 live from Palo Alto and on demand with leaders in data and AI. We'll be right back.